I have some things that I would like to say, but I am going to hold that till after the invitation song. I have some closing comments, that, personal comments that I'd like to make, and I'll do that at that time. I want to apologize to Brother Heath. Only one man should have to carry the burden of the, my name throughout his life. Uh, and I know that's a burden, Heath, because I've carried it all my life. So thank you for taking a little bit of it off of me. Uh, you know, in a gospel meeting, you always wonder to try to say things and preach things that will be encouraging, edifying, and uplifting. And you always wonder if you pick, chose the right topics or if you've hit the right stride, and I hope that during this week something that I've said during this week has been helpful and encouraging and edifying to you. But I always try to make a lesson that it matters not who you are or what, whether you're a member of the church or whether you're a member of another church or what your status or how long you've been a Christian. I always try to include one lesson that applies to all of us, and tonight's lesson applies to all of us. I'd like you to take your Bible out as we begin our study tonight in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. It says, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of the offspring who kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. When you and I and any person becomes a Christian, we're going to have to fight the good fight. We talked about that a little bit. I mentioned that last night from 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 12. One of the things that God has done to help us in that fight is to identify what our adversary will use in order to seek to destroy us. And his techniques and his methods are well explained in the Bible. And he is very good at what he does. He is tenacious, he is patient, he is confident in his ability to try to destroy those who would seek to follow and to please and to obey God. The vehicle that he will use to do that is sin. The power of temptation, it will make me happy, it can even fulfill me, but that is an illusion and that is a mirage. And it is something that the devil is very good at hiding that the happiness that seems to be the result of sin is very short-lived, it is temporary, and he is going to use temptation as a means of causing us to not submit to God, but to yield to sin. I appreciate Brother Leonard leading that song that he led this evening Yield not to temptation. That is our challenge. Being a Christian will not eliminate temptation from your life. It will not eliminate Satan testing us, Satan trying to destroy us, Satan trying to get us to give in to him once again and to become under his submission. We know this to be true from a biblical account that we read on very early on in Matthew. And that has to do with the temptations of our Lord in Matthew chapter 4 and 1 through 11. Jesus was tempted in three ways in those passages, and we will not read the whole text for time's sake, but we know that he was tempted in three ways. He was tempted to turn bread from stone, and he was tempted that way because he had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and he was hungry. And so this was a temptation to satisfy physical hunger. Nothing simple about that. Nothing simple about satisfying physical hunger. But he wanted him to demonstrate that he was the son of God, and that was the temptation of the lust of the flesh. And then he had pride. He wanted, he wanted Jesus to prove that he was the son of God by going on top of the temple and jumping off, and that Bible, he quoted a passage in Psalms. He misapplied it, of course, but he quoted it that God would protect him. Nothing would happen to him. And so he wanted the son to put the father to the test. And that was a temptation of pride. But 
the last temptation, a lot of people seem to think that that really wasn't a temptation. You see, Jesus was in the beginning. He was there when the world was created. He was part of the Godhead that created this whole world in six literal days. He was there. He left heaven. He came to earth. He was ascended. He went back to heaven. And so what he tempted him with in Matthew chapter 4 and the third temptation that he took him on the top of a high mountain and let him see all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, if you will bow down and worship me, I will give you all of these kingdoms. Well, what kind of temptation was that? That was a temptation to escape the cross. Here's a way that he didn't have to endure the cross. He didn't have to go through that anguish. He didn't have to go through the pain. He didn't have to go through all of that and bear the scourging and the loneliness and the physical pain that was endured. He could, he could overrun all of that if he would just bow down and worship Satan. But you remember what he said. He said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou worship. Now, in all of these temptations, they were overcome, not by miraculous means, not by God, not by deity qualities or attributes. Every one of these temptations were overcome through the word of God. Remember, it is written. It is written was the answer to every means of defeating the sin that he was tempted to commit. Why did he set and leave that example? Because, ladies and gentlemen, that is the means that God has given us in order to defeat sin is by the Word of God. It gives us instruction. It gives us counsel. It gives us wisdom, divine wisdom. It warns us. It can guide us. It can help us recognize what sin is. And by doing that, we can say no to it, and we cannot allow it to overcome us, overwhelm us, or to yield to it. But there's another passage that's very similar to what we read in Matthew chapter 4. It is in 1 John chapter 2. If you have your Bibles and turn to that, I want to read verse 15 through 17 of 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 through 17. The Apostle John wrote, Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of eyes, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God will abide forever. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the three avenues of sin. Every sin that man can commit goes down one of these three roads. It's either the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. That is the method. That is the mythology of Satan. That's how he's going to try to tempt us. That's how he's going to try to destroy us. And all sin, every sin that you can think of, goes down one of three avenues in order to get us to fail. But notice that this sin is of the world. What does it mean, love not the world? Now, this seems to be a contradiction. In John chapter 3, in verse 16, you all know that scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But now he says that we are not to love the world. Now, is there some kind of a conflict between John 3, 16 and 1 John chapter 2? No. In chapter 3 of John chapter 3, he's not talking about the planet. He wasn't the first tree hugger. He's talking about humanity. He died for humanity. He died for who he created that was lost and dying in sin. Here in 1 John chapter 2, he's talking about the flesh. He's talking about the thing that will lead us away from God by giving in to the appetites and the desires and the lust of the flesh. We're not to love the world. We can't love what we have in this world. One of the ways that Satan is tempting us, and whether we know it or not, is he's trying to get us enamored with this place that we live on. He's trying to get us to place more emphasis and love this more than we love heaven that God has promised to faithful. 
And he's very good at making this world appealing. And he's very good at making it produce in our eyes, in many's eyes, happiness and contentment and peace. But it's all an illusion because he's not telling you what you're going to pay to indulge in sin. Why? Well, then it might not look so appealing. So he has to hide it, like he did to Adam and Eve. Isn't that what he did? He said, did God say that you could eat of every tree in the garden? And Eve told the serpent exactly what God had said. He understood that, and all he did is add a three-letter word. God said, the day that you touch it, you eat it, you'll die. Satan said, you won't die. Herein is the conflict what God says, and what Satan says. They both can't be right. Somebody's lying, somebody's misleading, and somebody's trying to deceive someone. From that time to this time, we have to be smarter and not allow him to deceive us like he deceived Adam and Eve in the beginning because what God said would happen is exactly what did happen, because God does never, ever lies to man. Hebrews 6, 18 tells us that. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2 teaches the same thing. God does not lie to us. Sin is the enemy of the soul. Now, we're some 2,000 years removed. But have times changed? Yeah, they've changed. Technology's changed. The ability to travel's changed. Workplaces differ from years past, and they will continue to differ. Yeah, a lot of things have changed. But there are some things that haven't changed. And one of the things that hasn't changed is Satan still appeals in the same way that he has from the beginning. He's still going to work his, his appeal through those three avenues. That will never change. That will never be altered. He will always work to try to destroy man through those avenues. He has done it from the beginning of time and he will do it until time on earth is no more. We also understand he has, we have the same basic lust and pride. Man's not different. Oh, we, we're a little smarter, at least I hope we are. With our technology, our medicine, and we maybe live a little longer, and we've learned more about the human body. We've learned more about things. We have the ability to do more than we did in years past. All that's true, but the Desire and nature of man, that hasn't changed. Man's still man, and he still has the same basic nature, has the same ba basic problems with lust and pride. That hasn't changed, and that's not going to change anytime soon. That's not going to change, and you're not going to have this fight until you draw your last breath. You're going to have this fight as long as you live in the flesh. But that would be bad news, except Satan can't win. Listen to what I'm telling you. Satan cannot win without your help. He cannot win this fight. He is not equipped to win this fight. He can only win if we yield to temptation, if we give in. And that's why God has given us weapons, spiritual weapons, in order that he might not be successful. If it's handled correctly, temptation will not make you weaker, it will make you stronger. What is the difference of whether it makes you weaker or whether it makes you stronger? How you handle it, what you do with it, how you combat it. That's going to make a difference whether you're going to come out better or whether you're going to come out worse. I want to remind you of something before we get into some examples. God made a promise, and I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And you remember I told you a few moments ago, God has promised that he will not lie to us. He will always tell us the truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 13, he made a promise. Listen to his promise. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. Now, what does that mean? That means that there's no new temptation. 
There's no new way of sin. Now, it may have a different name. It may be put in a different dress. It may appear differently, but it's still either the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. These sins are common. They are every day. We all face them, and anyone that lives on this earth is going to face them. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. Let me read that again. Will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. What does that mean, brother? What does that mean that he will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able? That means you will always have the ability to say no. Every time. How? But with every temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. It can't defeat you. It cannot overwhelm you unless you yield and you give in. Temptation is not the sin. Temptation is not a sin. Yielding to temptation is the sin. But we've been told in many different ways in our culture, and even in the world, that sin will make us happy, that we'll be, we'll be more content, we'll be happier men and women if we commit sin. Well, let's look at a couple of illustrations and see if that indeed is true. I want to begin tonight with David and Bathsheba in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Did David sin with Bathsheba bring him happiness? Now, you can read this story in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And it was innocent enough. David went out on the top of his, his palace in the evening. Nothing simple about that. Walked out on the top of his roof. Nothing wrong with that. And when he walked out on his roof, there was a beautiful woman on another roof that he could see that was bathing. Now, what should David have done? What should he have done? What he should have done is he should have turned around and went back into his, into his bedroom. That's what he should have done. But what he, what he did is he continued to look. And when he continued to look, it generated lust in his heart. And then he went and did the next thing, then he inquired to find out who she was. And then he found out that she was the wife of one of his soldiers that were out in the field fighting his battle. And that should have been enough for him to stay away because she belonged to another man. But then he sent for her, and that enhanced the process. And then he committed adultery with her. And then when it was over, nobody knows the wiser until she tells him that she's with child. Now he's got a problem. He's not only committed adultery, he's not only violated his marriage vows, he's also now has a child. And so what's he going to do? Well, he's going to cover it up. So he sends for Uriah, brings him in under the skies of wanting to know how the battle's going. Brings him in, gets the report that says, you had a weary journey, you go down to your house, and you just stay at your house, and you go back tomorrow. But he doesn't go down to his house. He sleeps outside. And he finds out the next morning that Uriah didn't even go down and spend the night with his wife. That's what he wanted him to do. That's what he was hoping he would do. But he didn't do that. And then the second, second thing he did, he's got him, he got him intoxicated. And then hoped that that would get him, that he'd loose up, loosen up a little bit, and he would go down to his house. He would sleep with the wife. She would become pregnant, nobody would be the wiser. That didn't work either because he was too honorable. He says, how can I go down and refresh and eat and take my ease and be with my wife when the Ark of the Covenant is out in the field and God's people are in tents? How can I go and do that? You see what Uriah is? He's honorable. But you know what the most terrible thing that David did? He gave him a letter. And wanted him to give it to Joab. And you know what? He never looked at that letter. He never looked at what that letter said. But what was in that letter? 
David and instructed Joab, put him in the fiercest battle. Put him right on the front line and then back away from him. And he'll be killed. And don't let that bother you. This is what I want you to do. Joab, he's the commander of the army. He's to listen to the king. He does exactly what David told him, and Uriah is killed. Period of mourning passes. He sends for Bathsheba, takes him to be his wife, and now nobody's going to be the wiser. Wrong. Nathan, remember him? Nathan came and had a little story for David. He said this man had come, this stranger had come to this wealthy man, and it came time to feed this, this wealthy man, and he had a servant that had one little ewe lamb, and he kind of treated it as a household pet, and it was some, something that was very precious to, to the servant. And instead of taking from the many that he had in his flock, he didn't take one of his own. He took that poor servant's one sheep, and he killed it, and he fed the traveler with that one ewe lamb. And you remember what Nathan said to David? He said, what do you think ought to be done with that man? And the Bible says that David was rough and angry. That man should have to return fourfold for what he did. You know what? He was right about that. But do you remember the next words of Nathan? Let them burn in your mind. Thou art the man. That's what David had done. He took one man's wife. He had wives. Nathan said, if that wasn't enough, God would have given you more. And you took this one man's wife, and you brought this contempt upon Israel to blaspheme. And you remember when he was confronted, what did David do? David said, I have sinned. The Bible next says that the Lord put away David's sin. But it didn't come without a consequence. The child that was conceived in that illicit relationship did not live but died seven days after it was born. It would not live. You remember what David did when it was struck sick? Remember how he prayed, he fasted, he wouldn't eat, he wouldn't sleep. He prayed and asked God to reconsider, to not take the child's life. And then when he died, the servants were afraid to come and tell him because of how much he lamented when He was sick. And he noticed that they were whispering. He said, the child's dead, isn't he? Yes, master, the child's dead. Does he get distraught? Does he go to pieces? No. He goes and cleans up, washes up, asks for food, and sits down to eat. And his and his servants are just blown away. What are you doing? You were, you were all distraught and all beside yourself, and now you're just acting like you're in your right mind. And you know what? He told us a very important thing that we need to always remember. He said, while the child lived, I could petition God and pray and ask, and God could relent, and God could change his mind. But now that the child's died, God has spoken, and I have to accept it. He cannot come to me, but I can go to him. What about that illicit moment of pleasure brought David happiness? Do you think that illicit affair brought David happiness? Read Psalms 38. Read Psalms 51. He wrote those two Psalms about the inner struggle, and, the, and how bad he felt because of what he had done, because of how he had let God down, how he had took an innocent man's life. And it was something that just always, always was with David because he knew he failed when he yielded to this sin of lust. It didn't bring him the happiness that he thought he did, did it? And you know what? He had another thing that it did. And never took the sword far from his house. And he would end up having another son killed by one of his brothers, and then would even have his other one of his other sons, Absalom, try to take his kingdom away from him. How'd that work out for David? That didn't work out too good, did it? 
Well, I got another example for you. What about Aiken? Remember, they're taking the, con the period of conquest. They're going into Canaan. They're getting their inheritance. First battle is Jericho. And he tells them how to take Jericho. You remember marching around the, the city one time and then seven times the seventh day to shout and to blow the trumpets and the walls would fall and they'd come in. But he told them one other thing. He said, don't take any of the accursed things because they belong to me. Don't take any of the spoil. But what did he do? Turn to Joshua chapter 7. What did he do? They went to Ai to fight, and they lost. They went to Ai, and they lost the battle with just, and 36 men died. And they're beside themselves, and they don't know what to do. And, and he's told to get up. There is sin in the camp. There's sin in the camp. Now, what did he mean there's sin in the camp? Well, let's read Joshua chapter 6. Excuse me, chapter 7. And we're going to read down at verse 19. What he did is he brought all the children of Israel out. And he questioned them. And then he came to Achan. Let's see what happened when he comes to Achan. Verse 19, now Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver underneath it. So Joshua sent messengers and ran to the tent, and there it was hidden in the tent and with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all of Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkey, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones and burned him with fire after they had stoned him with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of the stones still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of the place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. You know, I heard a number of years ago where someone dared to say in the Bible class that, that man, that was a little hard, what God did to Achan. He took all of his children, took all of his possessions, and he stoned them and he burned them. But you know what? You know what those people forget? 36 men died in that battle of Ai because of the greed of one man. We are under some illusion that I have had people tell me in my lifetime, well, if I choose to do this, it just hurts me. If I choose to do this, it just hurts me. It's my life. It doesn't hurt anybody but me. That's a myth. That's a lie. Your actions can hurt a lot of people. It'll hurt, it'll hurt people you love. It'll hurt innocent people. It'll hurt people that have nothing to do with it. What will pay the price for the consequences of your actions? You see, how much did all that stuff mean now? Oh, it looked good when he saw it, but now what does it look like? Don't tell me that sin only affects the person that commits it. That's a lie. It affects everything around you and anything, anyone that feels anything and loves you to any degree. One sin makes a difference, folks. Did the 30 pieces of silver make Judas happy? You know, if you study the life of Judas, it's an interesting case study because 
after he's rebuked for something that Jesus did, he goes to the chief priest and he bargains with them to betray the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. And he goes into the garden and he kisses him and they sees him and he's betrayed. But the Bible says Judas was a thief. He had greed in his heart. And so he was just fulfilling the greed that he had in his heart. He had a corrupt character from the beginning. But what happened when he realized that they were really going to kill Jesus? He thought, you know, I'll warn him. They may even beat him, but they'll let him go. But when he, thought, when he saw that they were determined to kill him, what did he do? Turn to Matthew chapter 27. Here's what he did, beginning in verse beginning in verse number 3. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders. What does it mean when he saw that he was condemned? He realized what he had done. He realized he betrayed his master. He had betrayed him, and by his action, he had given Jesus to the enemy, and they're going to kill him. He's condemned. And he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders, saying, I have sinned that I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. And then he threw down the pieces of the silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. How did the money look now? I've often been asked, and maybe some of you have, would he have forgiven Judas if he'd have went, if he'd have went to the resurrected Lord and repented for betraying him? Would God have forgiven him? Did God forgive Peter, who denied him three times? Did God forgive Saul, who persecuted the church by Saul's own words, sent many of them to prison, cast his vote against him when they were putting him to death, and was even at the feet of those who stoned Stephen, did God forgive Saul? Yeah, I think he did. God forgave David. God forgave Peter, and he would have forgiven Judas. You see, what caused that to happen? Greed. And you know, we have a lot of examples about greed in the Bible and the misery that it brings upon man. This is just one. We have another one in Luke chapter 19 that deals with the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus and he wanted to know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I want you to turn to Luke's account. Luke chapter number 18. Luke chapter 18. I'll begin reading in verse 23. Excuse me. In verse number 17. Jesus was teaching and he said, Surely I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom uh, of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? There is no one is good but one, that is God. Now think about what this young man asked. He asked for eternal life. Isn't that a great question? And who did he ask? He didn't just ask anybody. He asked the one who had the answer. He asked the one that was the source of the answer to what he saw. He asked the Lord. Who better would know the answer to this question? You know the commandment. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these I've kept from my youth up. So when Jesus heard these things, he said, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. But when he heard this, he went away very sorrowful, for he was very rich. You see, the cost of discipleship was too high. He wasn't willing to pay it. He would rather have his possessions than to... Now, many television evangelists in our day have misused this account by saying, if we're going to be pleasing to God, we've got to get rid of all of our stuff, and we've got to give it away. But that's not the point of this this story. The point of this story is 
He lacked one thing. What was the one thing that he lacked in his in committing himself to God? He loved his money and his possessions more than he loved God. Brethren, that's a real temptation to us in this world. We get enamored with this life. We get enamored with our stuff. We get enamored with wanting this and wanting that. And we will put ourselves in deep debt. And we'll have to work hours and hours of overtime in order to pay it because we got to have this new thing. we got to have that new thing. we got to keep up with the Joneses. And we just consume it. And we have no happiness in our life because we got to pay for all of our things. You're trying to split your allegiance. And that's exactly what Satan wants you to do. Is that going to make you happy? No. You know, I've done a lot of funerals, attended a lot of funerals. I have yet to see a U-Haul behind a hearse. I have not seen anybody be able to take one. Now, I've seen people buried with it. I read about the great pharaohs that were buried with all their wealth, and when they opened those, those pyramids and they found it, you know what? That wealth was still there. He was long gone. His body was in the dust, but all that stuff was still there. It didn't benefit him in death. And then we have the story of the prodigal son. You know, prodigal son is an interesting story because in Luke chapter 15, he's a young man who understands his father is quite wealthy and maybe he's in good health and he may live a long life and he knows that he's got an inheritance coming, but he doesn't want to wait. He wants it now. Now, the, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us why the father divided his living and gave the young man his share of the inheritance. The Bible doesn't tell us why. But the Bible says he went into a far country and he wasted it with riotous living. And he got to the point that after all of his money ran out, his friends ran out. And he was in want. And he joined himself to a citizen of the, of the country he was in and began to take the pods and to feed the swine, which would be a despicable thing for a Jew to do. And he wanted to even eat the food that he was feeding to the swine. And you know what the great thing the Bible says about this young man? It says, when he came to himself. What does that mean, when he came to himself? You know what that means? That he finally opened his eyes where he really was. Remember what he said? He said, what is the matter with me? My father, servants have it better than I got it. I'll go to my father and I'll say, I've sinned before God and in your sight, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your higher servants. You know what that shows? That shows two things. That shows humility, and that shows remorse and a willingness to repent. And he went to his father, and he said exactly what he said he would do. I have wasted your living. I am not worthy to be your son. You just make me a hired servant. But let me ask you a question tonight. I want you to listen to me for a minute. Why did he come to himself? Why did he come to himself? Because he got so bad? No. You know why he came to himself? Nobody helped him. Too many times we enable the sinner to continue sinning because we help them to continue the thing that is destroying them. I'm not going to help somebody do what I know is going to destroy them, whether they're my son, my daughter, my parents, my spouse. I am not going to encourage them to continue to do what is wrong when I know that it is destroying their life and will take their life if they don't stop. He came to himself because no one helped him. You and I must understand that men and women must accept accountability and the consequences of sin. If they don't accept accountability and responsibility, then they will not learn anything. Turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 20. Look at verse number one. 
Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. And you can read Proverbs chapter 23 in verses 29 and 30, and it talks about the effects of alcohol that even if they're hit with something, they won't feel it, and when they awake, they'll want another drink. Does wine and alcohol produce happiness? You will never find the solution to any problem in a bottle in the bottom of a bottle. It will never bring you happiness. It will destroy your life. It will destroy everything around you, and it will never bring what they promise to bring. And here's one thing you need to remember about Satan. He can't fulfill the promise. You know, he says, go ahead and do this. It'll make you happy. He's lying to you. It'll never make you happy. Alcohol, drugs, relationships, ungodly living, it cannot produce long-lasting happiness. It's a deception. You know why I know? For sin taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. How many people has Satan deceived and killed? John 8. This is what John said. You are the, and Jesus said it, John recorded it. You are the, your father the devil. Desire of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. Every beer commercial is a lie. How many of you have seen the Miller beer commercial? They're out there on a lake. It's crystal clear. They're on a campground. The sun's going down. They're around the campfire. They're sipping on an old Milwaukee, and it says, it doesn't get any better than this. You think so? That's a lie. That's nothing but a, that's nothing but a mirage. But now, alcohol companies, now they're going to teach us how to, re- to drink respectfully. You see, they're, they're changing. They don't want you to go out and do, do you, uh, get a DUI. They don't want you to get behind a car and kill somebody. They want you to drink responsibly. God wants you to do that too by not drinking. That's a deception. You can't make sin look good. It may look good on paper. It may even feel good. But it is temporary. It does not last. All the shows that picture sexual immorality as producing happiness are false. Do you think it is by mistake? Do you think it is coincidence? Do you think it's an accident that 50% of primetime television, that means between six and nine, in all the primetime slots, depict homosexuality, fornication, adultery, and other things? in a favorable light, as if it's part of everyday life. They got a show, I've never watched it and never will, called The Modern Family. Look it up and see what m- members of the family, who they, they got, a, they got a, a homosexual there, they got two women that are living together, they got a man and a woman that are living together, another one that's had an affair with their father's wife. That's modern family? That's, what God, that's what's going to bring us happiness? It's a deception. All our peers are wrong when they say we're missing something. You live a dull life. I told you last night, a young woman that thought I lived a dull life because I didn't drink, I didn't corral, didn't smoke, I didn't, didn't go out and get drunk and have a good time. I'm missing something. What did I miss? What did I miss that would have brought me happiness? Little children will no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. Brother, you know what we need to do? We must learn the difference between good and evil. We must be able to discern the difference between good and evil. And if you don't discern the difference between good and evil, you will fall suspect to sin. Now let me bring this lesson to a close. Sin only brings fleeting pressure. Moses told us that. He would rather suffer the affliction of the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Here's a question I've been asked. 
Well, Keith, is sin fun? Yes. It is. But it's temporary. And it comes with a price tag. Satan won't tell you. God told you. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, verse 23. All unrighteousness is sin. 1 John 5, verse 17. Sin has consequences, ladies and gentlemen. Sin separates a man from God. Sin leads to spiritual death. Sin is the reason of every misery that we have in this life, everything that we hate about this life, death, sickness, unhappiness, misery, all of it can be traced back to sin. Sin is the reason, and the devil makes it appear that it's just a lot of fun, but it's a mirage. Now, I want to close this lesson. I did a lesson here a long time ago, and I, I, this was the theme of this lesson, and I want to close my lesson with this little phrase. I want to tell you tonight, sin will never fulfill its promises. But I will tell you, there are three things that sin will always do. Every time you commit it, whether it's the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life, every time you commit sin, I guarantee you that these three things are going to take place. Number one, it is going to take you farther than you want to go. Do you think somebody wakes up one morning and thinks, I think I want to become an alcoholic? But wakes up one morning and says, I think I want to have an illicit an affair with someone. I want to destroy somebody's marriage. You think somebody just wakes up one morning and decides to do that? No, it's a process. It's a process. It's step by step that we take in order to get there. And when you get on this road to sin, it's going to take you farther than you ever wanted to go. How many people have sat across my desk in my offices and all the places I've ever preached and get their life in a mess and they're going in the wrong direction, they're suffering the consequences of their sin, they look me right in the eye and say, Keith, I don't know how it happened. I don't know how it got this far. I do. It's the nature of the beast. It's the nature of the beast. Sin will keep you longer than you want, you want to stay. Do you think once you get into sin, you think sin's just going to let you go? You think he's going to say, oh, well, that's okay. You tried that. You can go back to what you were doing now. Say now he wants to keep you. He wants to smother you in it. He wants to lock you in it so you like it so much that you can't see what it's doing to you. And he won't let go. You'll have to fight to get out. But here's the worst part. Here is the worst part about sin. Sin will cost you more than you intended to pay. There's a cost involved with sin, friend. Sometimes it's immediate. Sometimes people don't listen to God and they immediately find out that they did the wrong thing. Other times it takes time. Other times... They won't realize until they wake up on the, the day that they close their eyes for the last time, and they're in torment, and they're wondering, how did this happen? It's because you didn't think it, you thought sin didn't cost anything. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing good that I could spin sin to tell you that you ought to participate in it. I can't spin sin to make it sound good. I can't spin it to make it sound like it's not as bad as, as I just said it is. Sin is bad, and there's nothing good about sin. Sin will destroy you. It will kill you spiritually, and let me tell you something, brethren. It can destroy every good thing in your life, and it can do it in a snap of a finger. Your life can be turned upside down in a snap of a finger because you or I will yield to sin. I don't think anybody gets behind the wheel of a car drunk and tends to hit somebody and kill them. I don't think they intentionally woke up and thought that they would do that one day. I don't think that's to happen. They didn't think. They didn't think, and they got behind the wheel, and you know what? They got to live with it for the rest of their life. I only slept with them once. 
but now I've got a child. That person's life forever changed just for one act of pleasure, one moment, and their life forever changed. You get on a drug, and it gets a hold of your body because of your genetic makeup and because of how your body gets to like it. And it gets a hold of you, and it won't let go until it's completely destroyed your life. But it never could have happened if you'd have listened to God, and if you'd have stayed away from it, it could have never done it to you. And then when it happens, we want to blame society. We want to blame the government. We want to blame mom and dad. We want to blame the kid that called us names when we were little or that somebody dropped me when I was a baby. Instead of admitting, I was stupid. I didn't listen. Let me tell you something, brethren. Nobody's immune to this. I remember, let me get close you with, with an own personal story. <laughs> when I was 17 or 18, my dad was talking to me one day as he was sitting at the kitchen table, and he said, Keith, don't ever start to smoke. It's a filthy habit. costs a lot of money. And it can get a hold of you, you can't quit. The whole time he's smoking. Blowing smoke in my face. And he says, don't drink. Because it might get a hold of you and not let go. While he's drinking a beer. What does that tell a young man? What does that tell me? You know what I'm thinking in my mind? It hadn't hurt you. You do it and you're all right. But you know what? You know what I'll be forever thankful for in my life? I didn't like liquor. I'll be for, I'm, I'm forever grateful. I didn't like it. Oh, did I try it? Oh, yeah, I tried it. I was wrong, but I tried it. I didn't listen. I knew what the Bible said. I knew what my parents told me was right. But I tried it. But my, my salvation was I didn't, didn't have an alarmment to me. But I had a good friend. I got a cousin who had had an allurement to him. And he's an alcoholic to this day. I begged him to quit. I begged him, I put him in somewhere in rehab and get better, but he looks me right in the eye and says, Keith, I don't want to quit. You see, it's got him. But it never would have got him if he never started. You know what, I've I've talked to drug addicts. I've talked to alcoholics. I've talked to people that got wrapped up and destroyed their life from pornography. You know, I've watched people destroy their life with immorality, and I've asked them all the same question. Where did it go wrong? Where did you get on this road? When did it go wrong? And it's always the same answer. It's when I started. If I never put the bed on the table, I never would have became a compulsive gambler. If I never picked up a drink, I couldn't have become an alcoholic. If I never put the stuff in my veins, the drugs could have never got a hold of me. And if I had followed God's law or morality, I never would have destroyed my life like I have. But you see, the problem is we think we're smarter than God. And we think, how many people have looked at me and said, Keith, I got this. I know what I'm doing. Only to find out Satan is laughing all the time. So my advice to you, brethren, sin cannot make you happy. It wasn't designed to make you happy. Sin was designed to kill you spiritually and to destroy every good thing in your life if you will allow it to do so. God's warned you about it. He's told you how Satan will do it. He tells you that he won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able He's given you a way of escape. He's done everything he can to help you not succumb to this disease. But will you listen? Will you listen? I'm begging you. God's begging you. That's why he sent his son to die, because he knew men wouldn't listen to him. He sent his son to die so we could recover from our foolishness to commit sin. If you're here tonight and you are not a Christian, you need to become one. You need to become one not to suit me, not to suit your parents, not because it feels like the right thing to do. You've got to do it because you're lost unless you do it. You're going to go to the devil's hell unless you do it because there's no recovery if you and I die in sin. There's no way around it. 
Just read the Bible. There's no way around it. Hearing the word of God, repenting, confessing his name before men, submitting to baptism, contact the blood of Christ, that'll put you in the family of God. That'll make you part of the household of God, make you a joint heir. That'll wash away your past sin, your condemnation and the guilt. God will remove all of that. But brethren, the fight isn't over. Listen to me, brethren, the fight's not over. It's not over till you draw your last breath. You've got to fight. You've got to say no. You've got to not yield to sin. Because if you do, you will eternally regret it. If you're here tonight and you are a Christian and you think you can hold on to the world and you can hold on to God at the same time, you are fooling yourself. You are deceiving yourself. And please don't learn this lesson the hard way. Please don't wake up on the other side and realize that you made a grave mistake. God's giving you an opportunity to fix it tonight. And if we can help you in any way to make your life right with God in either one of these ways, we stand ready to assist you as together we stand and as we sing.